Hello, Booktube, and welcome back to Poetry Tuesday. Every Tuesday on this channel from now until the end of time, we are going to grapple with contemporary poetry wherever we find it in an attempt to make it feel a little bit, at least to me, a little bit less, less off-putting, a little bit less like a closed party, and more like something that, with lots of practice and lots of exposure, I can come to understand uh, on some more critical level. Uh, and it hasn't really been grappling, right? I mean, it's the, it's the third week in February. We've been doing this for... Uh, you know, eight weeks, and it hasn't been it hasn't been all grappling. We've encountered some very nice stuff, uh, I think. Some some duds, but otherwise no. So I, I thought today we would go back to a familiar venue, the New Yorker. <laughs> this is this is one of the latest issues of the New Yorker. That is a lovely cover called "Spring Blossom" by Kadir Nelson, and I was marveling at just how wonderful it is. The background of flowers on blue, flowers on green on the dress pattern flowers on red and white in the woman's hair. Just absolutely lovely. I was just staring at it, thinking, A, how unusual it is for New Yorker cover, and, and B, how lovely it is. And it, I, I admit, I only belatedly realized that it is also an homage. This is also a Eustace Tilly cover. <laughs> uh, those of you who may not be familiar with the New Yorker, the New Yorker's very odd and very dated sort of house mascot is Eustace Tilly. Uh, a 1990s New York dandy with a high starched collar and uh, an, an eyepiece <laughs> uh, th through which he is typically seen to be gazing on a butterfly. And you see in the background on the wallpaper, there is a butterfly right there. <laughs> uh, this is uh, The New Yorker over the years has played around and, and invited other artists to play around with the Eustace Tilly icon. And it took me a while to realize that this is, that is the, classic, the classic Eustace Tilly pose only transposed into worlds unknown in the 1920s, 1920s New York. Uh, so uh, I thought we'd go through this issue. Uh, this is the February 18th and 25th issue. It's an extra big issue. It has a long piece by Jeffrey Tubin on Roger Stone and Jerome Corsi, these, these creatures that we, whose names we would not know if it weren't for the scandals that are enveloping them today. It has a long piece by uh, Ronan Farrow and a collaborator on... Uh, Byzantine lobbying efforts that uh, didn't have any of the fire, any of the dynamite that, that Ronan Farrow's uh, reporting sometimes tends to have in the New Yorker and elsewhere. Uh, but it does have two poems. The issue does have two poems. Now, one of them uh, I want to skip completely. The other one is the one I want to concentrate on uh, because I want to know what you think of it. I'm learning a lot, not only from not just skipping this stuff. <laughs> I, admit, I admit, in fact, I insist, it helps a lot not to just skip the stuff that you're antithetical to. You will learn a lot if you engage with it directly. I already knew that. I don't know why I let this this get to me so long with contemporary poetry. I have a suspicion. I have a theory. I have a theory that a large part of my antipathy in contemporary poetry came from knowing some contemporary poets and finding them less than admirable. <laughs> I think that maybe leaked over and did it. Uh, but one way or another, uh, this poem is by Marianne Baruch, B-R-O-U-C-H. And it's called, I Saw a House, Comma, a Field. So, I Saw a House, a Field. Uh, and there's, there's quite a bit going on. I, I, oh, <laughs> it's the only thing you care about, anyway. There's the bean. Hello, bean. <laughs> That's enough for today. <laughs> uh, let me read this to you. Uh, we're reading poetry, Frida. Mm -hmm. You don't care about poetry, do you? <laughs> no. All right, well, I'll angle this so that you can see here. Since for those of you who aren't interested in poetry, you'll have something to pass the time. Uh, so here is the poem. Uh, Most of the rooms muted by cold, and the furniture there with its human chill under vast drapes of plastic for the season. Because eventually we are an austerity, walking room to room, enamored and saddened, all the crazy variations of bed and table, clocks, books on a shelf, Foreign harbors etched some yesterday framed on a wall, and the effrontery of windows assuming how lovely out, a certainty of lawn and woods, distance on a road, voices in summer drift up and move away. Desire. That continues, and continuing is the part loved, just as there is emptiness with an occasion in it, clothes to remove before you ease into a bath. Branches and branches, scraping is winter. And after midnight, near morning, when I stepped out, the moon by half, was it a deer I saw, a little one and maybe its mother? Or they were smaller than deer, or larger? 
Oh, but they were strange, stopped across the snow like that. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, in the first reading of this, on the one hand, uh, I thought, okay, this is fairly straightforward. I think it's kind of lovely. And it's fairly straightforward. It is, it is uh, a house, a scene, a moment, much like, much like is, is foreshadowed in the title. Except for that middle stanza. <laughs> that middle stanza, I'm not quite sure I know what to do with. Let me read it to you again. It's just the first, the first word of the stanza is just the single word desire, followed by a period. Desire that continues and continuing is the part loved, just as there is emptiness with an occasion in it, closed to remove before you ease into a bath. And I, as much as I love the imagery of the rest of the poem, including the, the, uh, that, that you know, quiet backcountry road moment of doubt in the last stanza, I do not know quite what that middle stanza is doing there. What is the desire that is being talked about here? What is the uh, what is it again? The emptiness with an occasion in it. It is is it the the house temporarily abandoned with sheets over the furniture? Is that the emptiness here? But if that's true, then clothes to remove before you ease into a bath is what? So the emptiness of the house is the thing that would be removed once it becomes filled with people on occasion again? What, what did you make of that? I will once again write the poem down below. I, I don't think, considering that these things are in magazines on newsstands, and considering that the New Yorker website offers the poet reading them for free online, uh, I'm not thinking that I'm running into any kind of copyright trouble <laughs> by not only reading the poem, but also by including the text down below. It would be different, I think, if, if we were here just to rag on these things, but, uh, but I think we've almost always found some genuine worth, and I think there's definitely genuine worth here. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, going to wrap this up for now. This is, this is uh, an amazingly a short video, and I want to know what you think. What do you think of I saw a house, a field? Uh, especially that middle part. <laughs> that middle part is bath. The rest of it I think I understand. It's just the rest of it is a reverie poem. It's just... You know, I'm here in this place that once meant something to me. It's now emptied of that something. It might might have meant something to other people, but it's now emptied of that as well. And everything's still and quiet, and it's winter. And I, there's that moment uh, when you see something out across the field, and it's moving, and you're not quite sure what it is. And that that is captured the stillness of it, the the oddness of it, where for a minute you're not sure of any of the parameters of what you're seeing. That's, I think, captured really well. All of that makes sense to me, except that middle part, <laughs> that desire part. So read it over and let me know what you think. <laughs> but but uh, this is probably not the last you'll see this face today. We probably have other things to talk about. So I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.